Do you know what ZLR stands for? How about ED or ESP? And what in the world is fuzzy logic? I'm your host, Azrael Knight, and on today's episode of This Old Camera, we learn all about the Olympus IS-1, a pivotal model in a whole new category of camera released in the 1990s, and all the strange acronyms that come with it. The Olympus IS-1, also known as the IS-1000 or L-1000, is what is considered today to be a bridge model. That is, not quite an SLR because the lens is integrated, but not quite a point and shoot due to its lens quality, slightly larger form factor, and manual features. At the time, cameras like the IS-1 were called new concept, all in one, and sometimes bridge, but all definitions still left in quotation as these names for it were still being fleshed out and decided on. IS, by the way, stands for Integrated System. The earliest mention I could find for the IS-1 was an article written in the Chicago Tribune on September 28, 1990, by Andy Grunberg titled, Olympus IS-1, a hybrid camera with a mind of its own. It was not entirely a favorable review either. Now, I don't think I'm a certified technophobe, says Grunberg, but I had the darndest time at Olympus's press preview when I went to use the camera. Spotting a nearby spread of cheeses, grapes, and assorted foodstuffs, I decided to try the camera's macro setting. Actually, there are two, one at the tele range of its 35 to 135 millimeter zoom, and one at the wide angle position. I picked the tele macro setting, closed in on a grape, and tried to fire, no dice. Taking pity on me, a nearby Olympus representative explained that the camera was designed not to fire if the picture would be out of focus or ill-exposed. Apparently, I was out of focusing range closer than 1.9 feet. Grunberg ends his review with, Set to anything other than point-and-shoot mode, the IS-1 seems to have a mind of its own, which I suppose is what camera makers think camera users want. It blinks, it zooms, it sets its own exposure, and tells you about them on a big LCD panel. But give it to an old-fashioned photographer without an instruction book, and it will soon be confined to dust-catching duty on a shelf in the hall closet. Of course, he was just handling a prototype, but not the greatest start for Olympus. The earliest magazine review I could find on the Olympus IS-1 is brief and alongside Nikon N6006, and the Canon EOS Rebel, written by Herbert Kepler in Popular Photography in November. Kepler calls the long-awaited, much-rumored IS-1 incredibly compact and a move towards the territory of new concept all-in-one cameras such as the Chinon Genesis 3 and the Ricoh Mirai. Much of the review discusses the features, the minimum focusing distance of 23 and 5 8 inches, or 15 and 3 quarters on macro, the max shutter speed of 1 over 2000, and the max flash sync speed of 1 over 100. A couple of the more interesting features mentioned was the spot meter for backlit situations, which samples about 1.8% of the image, and the G40 flash unit, which can fire at the same time as the pop-up flash. This review of the IS-1 was conducted on a pre-production model as well, and the price was estimated at 500 US dollars, or about a grand in today's money. Outdoor Photographer did their first impressions on the Olympus IS-1 titled New SLR Category. The new IS-1 is an SLR by strict definition, says Seth Weber, it doesn't look like one, however. Outwardly, it more closely resembles the Super Zoom 330 or 300, seeming to borrow from camcorder configurations. Weber says it feels nice in the hands, uh, though it may take some getting used to, and mentions the ED glass. Weber says Olympus calls it extraordinary dispersion, but we'll hear another definition later. Correct exposure in a multitude of difficult lighting situations is handled by a fuzzy logic ESP light metering system, which tries to do its best to second guess your thoughts, if you knew what to think. In short, it draws a distinction between centered subjects and peripheral image areas, and caters to the needs of the center. Weber calls the IS-1 a lot of system in a small package. 
Peterson's Photographic also chimed in on the Olympus IS-1, naming it one of the top 10 hottest cameras for 1991, alongside the likes of the Canon EOS Rebel and the Nikon N6006, claiming the camera can suit the needs of anyone from point and shooter to real photographer. All the elements of the IS-1's zoom lens are multi-coated to reduce flare and improve contrast, and it employs a special extra low dispersion glass to reduce chromatic aberration and produce sharper images with better contrast. They mention the Fuzzy Logic ESP and learn it stands for electro-sensitive pattern. And the IS-1 has a new TTL phase detection autofocus system, which requires a lot less internal movement. The IS-1 is featured on the December 1990 cover of Peterson's Photographic and includes a full length review by Mike Stensvold called Something for Everyone. You knew right away that he was taking this new category of camera with a grain of salt. In this age when a revolutionary new camera is announced virtually every month, one tends to be a bit skeptical about such claims, says Stensvold, but does concede that there are unique features to be had here not found in most point-and-shoot cameras, like a metered manual exposure mode, which enables you to set a desired shutter speed and lens aperture and thus control the degree of action freezing or blurring in shots of moving subjects, as well as the depth of field in shots where that's important. In regards to the unique shape, Stensvold says, it almost forces you to hold the camera in the steadiest way possible, unlike other so-called bridge cameras, whose shapes encourage one-handed shooting, great for macho posturing, but not for producing sharp images. And goes on to say that the camera's controls are well-placed for easy access while shooting. Praised is the ED glass, which is the second element from the front, and the lens itself, which has a fairly wide max aperture for a point-and-shoot camera. Also given props is the twin-tube intelligent flash system, with the capability of lighting subjects up to 32.8 feet away at ISO 400, as well as the ability to light subjects up close without overexposing due to the IVP or Intelligent Variable Power System. Three metering modes are offered with the Olympus IS-1. Standard ESP, which stands for Electrosensitive Pattern. This mode is automatically employed in Programmed AE mode. Center Weighted Average Metering, which is utilized in Aperture Priority and Metered Manual modes, as well as Spot Metering, which can be selected in any mode. The article also goes over all the auto and semi-auto modes, both technical and creative. With so many different modes, it may get confusing for some users, so you can return to the basic point and shoot anytime by pressing mode and the plus minus buttons at the same time. Kind of like a home button for your iPhone. Part of the reason the camera is able to pack so much into such a compact design is the S-Wrap film system. Stensvold says, the camera's unique S-Wrap film system makes for a more compact, better balanced camera, along with easy auto loading. Another reason the form factor is smaller than expected is the M pattern reflex viewfinder, rather than the standard four pattern SLR pentaprism. In conclusion, Mike Stensvold claims that the Olympus IS-1 comes closer than most to truly being a camera for everybody. In point-and-shoot mode, it's as simple to use as any camera in its class. It offers versatility to the more creative snap shooter, and it's got some advanced features found in few other such cameras, making it useful to more serious photographers as well. In this article, the list price is 800 USD, or about 1671 in 2021 money. Also chiming in December of that year was Canada's Photo Life magazine, summarizing their innovative new models found in that year's Photokina. The IS-1 was featured at the 1990 trade fair side by side with such giants as the Leica RE and the Contax RTS-3. The ergonomic design of the Olympus IS-1 incorporates some impressive features, states Photo Life, 35 to 135 millimeter power zoom, dual strobe intelligent flash, TTL autofocus, programmed auto exposure, fuzzy logic ESP light metering, and fully automatic S-Wrap loading system. 
December 1990 was the IS-1's time to shine as it was also featured as one of popular photography's top cameras for 1991. The polycarbonate body can be easily held in one hand, but it's better steadied with two, says popular photography. They also inform the reader that the grip is quite comfortable and talk about something that they call zoom focal length memory. Something that is a unique feature that lets you select a favorite zoom setting and then have the camera's power zoom automatically stop at that specific focal length. Much like the review by Mike Stensvold, a lot of what is mentioned is technical in nature but does end with this in consideration. Certainly the Olympus IS-1 is a fascinating and capable performer. You should consider if its size, convenience, and moderate choice of focal lengths are what you need and want. Starting in 1991, American Photo contributing editor Russell Hart gives a small mention to the compact wonder in his article Photophile titled New Concept Coup, stating that the spacey Olympus IS-1 offers many of the advantages of system SLRs, including reflex viewing, and a wide choice of focal lengths. The IS-1 gets an honorable mention in February's issue of Outdoor Photographer alongside other lenses as part of an article called Prestige Glass, which looks at the more affordable cost of lenses with, among other things, ED glass. Thankfully, with the advent of computerized design and high-tech manufacturing processes, the task is no longer as laborious as it once was. Hence, we are now seeing certain superior telephotos and zooms at affordable prices. Peterson's Photographic published a special bonus section in their February issue called How to Buy a Camera, adding the IS-1 as a potential for buyers. They actually called it an SLR with built-in 35-135mm to 135 power zoom lens, which some so far have argued that SLR is a loose definition. A new, at the time, Canadian magazine would feature a four-page review in their March-April 1991 issue. Photo Digest writer Peter Burian put the IS-1 through its paces with multiple locations like Vancouver Island and Dundurn Castle in Hamilton, Ontario, as well as multiple films including Agfa Chrome 100, Fuji Chrome 100, Ektachrome 50 HC, and Fuji Chrome Velvia 50. Peter begins by stating that point and shoots have outsold SLRs over the previous few years, and companies have started adding more and more features. This was the evolution leading up to the larger bridge camera, so-called because it was expected to bridge the gap between compact and SLR. Built around a zoom lens, some of these offer extensive and automated capabilities and are billed as all-in-one cameras. Recently, someone coined the phrase, new concept, a moniker that particularly suits the most versatile addition to this category, the Olympus IS-1. The zoom lens is praised with its ED glass and the fact that every element is multi-coated. These enhancements prove themselves worthwhile in terms of outstanding image quality. Some of my slides appear to equal the sharpness of those produced with my professional zoom, which cost more than this entire camera and all accessories, says Peter. Even when shooting into the light, contrast was well maintained thanks to the fine optical coatings used in the lens. One of the things that seemed to really impress the reviewer was being able to change the zoom controls to manual focus control, essentially changing the power zoom control to a power focus control, um, though he did note that you'll want to sort out your focal length first. I appreciated that they went into a bit more detail on what exactly electrosensitive pattern and fuzzy logic meant for your final image. It will first consider brightness in the central area of the scene and then across the entire frame separately, he says. This information is then evaluated and compared to 14 individual possibilities instead of merely two stored in its memory. In a fraction of a second, subtle corrective action is automatically taken for accurate metering in a wide range of lighting conditions. We also learn in this review that the G40 flash unit has a range of 130 feet at ISO 100. Overall, Photo Digest gave a glowing review of the IS-1 with very few hangups and said that anyone frustrated with the limitations of a point and shoot who also cannot afford an SLR will be very happy with the hybrid that is the Olympus IS-1. 
In a seemingly out of place article featuring camcorders in the May 1991 issue of Outdoor Photographer was a piece called The New Fuzzy Logic Cameras. And we learn a bit more about the technology and its origins. The fuzzy logic theory was developed by Professor Lofty Zade of the University of California at Berkeley in the 1960s, says writer Frank Hughes. He used it to describe the difference between the yes or no way digital computers think and the continuously variable way we think. Fuzzy logic got its name from the capability it has to make logical decisions even when the input data is conflicting or fuzzy for standard logical systems. We also learned from this article that the Olympus IS-1 is the first 35mm camera to use fuzzy logic in its exposure control circuit. Let's take a break from reviews for a moment and talk about advertising. The earliest ad I could find appeared in the November 1990 issue of Popular Photography. It was a three-page spread that asked their readers, remember the first time you received a fax, talked on a cellular phone, or heard a CD? Now, obviously, this question is meant to provoke the idea that the Olympus IS-1 is a state-of-the-art piece of camera tech, and not only that, but a new and improved version of the SLR. Here is an example of the Olympus using the term ZLR for the first time to define themselves as something not quite an SLR. The ad also implies you'll hold the future in your hands and claims to be the first camera with a built-in lens to include ED glass. Other claims in the ad include a design made to balance in the hand, a lens that can zoom from 35 to 135 in one second, and a dual strobe flash. Peterson's Photographic also ran an ad in November, including the Olympus IS-1 by Supreme Camera and Video based out of Brooklyn, New York. Every aspect of the IS-1 is an example of advanced systems integration, claims the ad. Capson Group Incorporated also ran several ads in Photo Digest and Photo Life in 1991 and 1992. A January Photo Digest ad called the IS-1 the new shape of photography, a new concept, and the world's first integrated system zoom lens reflex. The August Issues ad called the camera as astonishing as the pictures it takes. A December 1991 ad in Photolife magazine reuses the same language from another ad stating that the camera has a uniquely ergonomic design that complements today's active lifestyle. The largest ad I came across was one of those multi-page deals you see sometimes that structure themselves like a review but is labeled special advertising section in the top corner. Titled, I did it all with the IS-1, published by Popular Photography in January 1992, we are immediately informed that Joe is sick. Our protagonist needs to get to the airport right away and doesn't even have time to grab his SLR and accessories. Thank goodness for the Olympus IS-1. Its smooth, low contoured shape slips easy as pie into the portfolio. Just bring the 28mm and 200mm lenses, the macro kit, and some extra film. Funny how he didn't have time to bring the SLR and a couple of lenses, but he had plenty of time to bring the IS-1 and a couple of adapters. Throughout the special ad, the gentleman is met with a slew of different scenarios for the IS-1 to tackle. A disbeliever on the flight, a casual group shot after a business meeting, Aunt Louise's prized flower, Uncle George's restored car, a football game, an impromptu modeling shoot, and some creative night photography. Of course, everything is fabricated and the readers will be able to figure that out, but the message is clear, the IS-1 is versatile, and with just a couple accessories will perform like an SLR. Olympus at this time also had an ad campaign both in print and on television titled, Never Miss Another O. This wasn't just for the IS-1, as seen here in this commercial for the Infinity Super Zoom 300. O is goodbye. O is together. O is capturing our own history. O is the new Olympus Infinity Super Zoom 3000, the world's smallest, lightest, weatherproof zoom camera. It allows you to get close to some of life's most precious O's, like Welcome Home. Here's another commercial for the Olympus Infinity Super Zoom 330. O can sometimes be agony. 
or O can be hope. O is always forever. Without O, there would be cameras, but no Olympus. Pictures, but no memories. And there would be no Infinity Super Zoom 330 to grab so many of the O's that make life so good. Olympus. Never miss another O. I don't know about you, but I think Agony is an O I can definitely miss. I was actually really surprised when I saw this commercial, and I can imagine the letters Olympus would get if they released a commercial like that today. Without O, there'd be no apology. Without O, there'd be no oopsie. And without O, there'd be no outdated. Olympus. Never miss another O. Here's a two-page ad featuring a boxer. Without O, there'd be no boxers, no hope, no glory. There'd be fighters, but no contenders. There'd be no gold medals, and there'd be no Olympus IS-1 to capture all these moments. Another boxer-themed one-page ad was published in October. <laughs> Ooh, an O-month. Uh, with a very similar message. Another one on the following October seems to just line up the O's. And of course, we couldn't have Christmas without O. There'd be no snowflakes, no eggnog, nothing to open. There would be Santa Claus, but he wouldn't be jolly. Lucky for Santa, there's no O in diabetic, I guess. It's all kind of strange. Olympus would use this campaign for several cameras until at least 1994, as far as I can tell. Speaking of Christmas, the IS-1 would make it to Outdoor Photographer's Winter Guide at the end of 1991, claiming it will capture all the merry moments. It would make Popular Photography's top camera list for 1992 and 1993, but quickly replaced with the IS-2 and IS-3 DLX. Now, while there is some conflicting information online as to when the IS-2 was released, I believe it was announced around the same time as the IS-3. In this article, Proof Sheet, the IS-2 is being introduced alongside a couple of point shoots. They refer to it as the middle member of Olympus's all-in-one zoom lens reflex family. And here is the reveal of the IS-3 DLX from the Spotlight on Photokina, published three months previous, where they state that the IS-3 DLX is based on the highly successful IS-1, and to look for another camera from Olympus soon. It's anyone guess why the IS-3 would be announced first, but it seems to me that they were trying to pair them together to offer the consumer choice. This commercial released in 1996 seems to lend to that. When you talk serious photography, you don't talk cameras, you talk systems. You talk ED precision optics for superior clarity. 35 to 180 millimeter zooms to get you in there with the action. Thinking flash for maximum control and flexibility, remote control to put yourself in the picture. When you talk serious photography, the Olympus IS 2000 and 3000 series. Serious photography, built in. Olympus. At any rate, for its time, the IS line was very successful and would continue on with multiple models until the early 2000s. From here, we'll go over some basic operations then I'll show you my field test, and finally I'll let you know my personal pros and cons so you can determine if this camera is right for you. This section is not meant to be a full manual, but an introduction to the camera. Definitely enough to get you started. For a PDF of the full manual, see the link in the description. The first thing that you want to do is give your camera power. The battery compartment can be found on the underside of the unit. Use a coin or strong thumbnail to open the compartment. The IS-1 takes two CR123A batteries, place them as indicated, and close the battery door. Turn the power on by flipping this switch on the left side. Perform a battery check by pressing the mode and plus minus button at the same time. If nothing shows up, you have good batteries. If a partial battery icon blinks, you have a low battery. And if the icon is solid and shows continuously, you'll need to replace them right away. To load a roll of film, slide the back cover release upward, located on the right side at the grip. 
Insert a roll of film and align the film leader with the film loading indicator. A canister with DX coating is required. Close the back cover, making sure the film canister isn't sticking up. You will hear the film advance and a one should appear on the LCD panel. By default, you should be in program mode. If you're not sure what mode you're in, you can reset to this mode by pressing the mode and plus minus button at the same time. Adjusting the focal length is as simple as the TW button on the left of the lens barrel. T for telephoto and W for wide angle. If you want to use these buttons for power focus, just set your desired focal length first, then press the PF button. And now the TW button will adjust focus. Press PF again to switch back to zoom mode. Focus on your subject by half pressing the shutter release located on the top of the grip. Once the subject is in focus, press the shutter release the rest of the way to fire. If you're dealing with a backlit subject, you can switch to spot metering, which will judge exposure from a small area in the center. Simply press the spot button in any mode and it will be indicated on the LCD panel. To adjust exposure modes, hold the mode button located on the back in the upper left area and press the shift button just behind the shutter release until the desired mode is displayed. You can choose between program or P, which is basically full auto, aperture priority or A, which will allow you to adjust aperture and will change the shutter for you, or M for manual, which is, as you've probably guessed, full manual. In aperture priority mode, you'll use the shift buttons to adjust to aperture. You can use exposure compensation by holding the plus minus button and using the shift buttons. In manual exposure mode, shift buttons are again used to adjust aperture, but holding the plus minus and using shift adjusts your shutter speed. For more information on the advanced functions of this camera, be sure to read the full manual linked in the description, but this should be enough to get you out there taking photos. For my field test, I utilized two Olympus IS-1s, one loaded with Ilford HP5 Plus and the other with good old Kodak Gold 200. Let's take a look. My field test went pretty well. I was able to utilize a few of the features like fill flash, spot meter, and even the power focus. Here's an example of using the spot meter and power focus under the bridge. I had some issues locking focus in the dim light, and I knew the contrast in lighting would also throw off the light meter. Here's a couple of examples of using the fill flash. First, this tree with the knitted arms wrapped around was very dark and it ended up doing a decent job of balancing the light with the background. And same with this truck in the shade. Let's talk about some pros and cons. Pros. Under the radar. Because this camera is not hip or cool, it's inexpensive. Looking online, you'll see most go on eBay for under $30 Canadian. If you're looking to get into film, this would offer you everything you need to get started at the cost of two or three rolls of Portra. A decent zoom, a built-in flash, and both automatic and manual modes. A great view. 
The viewfinder on this is surprisingly good. It will indicate when you've achieved focus and when the power focus is on. It displays both shutter and aperture settings, as well as if exposure compensation is being used and whether your flash or spot meter is on. Cons. No ISO control. As far as I can tell, and I've read the manual three times now, there is no way to change the film speed. You can trick the camera by using exposure compensation, but that's about it. A hard load. Film loading is frustrating. I'm not sure if it's just my two models, but the canister flips up no matter how carefully I place it. I have to hold the canister down almost until the door is closed and give it a good push to get it to snap shut. Overall, it's hard not to recommend this camera at its current price point. It's unique, inexpensive, and produces images I thought were better than most point and shoots and probably on par with some SLRs. I will say though that the next 10 years will probably see a drop in number of working models. I would imagine these are hard to fix when they fail and the rubber buttons may start to degrade as well. I also noticed one of my models had a harder time focusing than the other, so working quality models will vary. That's all for now. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of This Old Camera. If you did, please consider becoming my patron on Patreon. Through Patreon, I offer exclusive content like darkroom prints mailed out six times per year, as well as early access to all of my videos. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter. And until next time, stay classic.